In today's modern entertainment landscape, superheroes are everywhere. Thanks to the success of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and big screen stalwarts like Superman, Batman and the X-Men, these costumed heroes have become firm fixtures in virtually every aspect of modern pop culture. Superheroes play such a big role in the media we consume today that it's almost unimaginable to think of a character failing to make it to the big screen, having a project ready to go, but for whatever reason never seeing the light of day. However, there is a storied history of comic book films toiling in development hell for many years, with these projects including some of the very biggest names in the entire superhero genre. From numerous attempts to resurrect the Batman franchise after 1997's Batman and Robin, to ambitious plans to bring the Justice League together years before Zack Snyder's film, to decades long attempts to adapt the unadaptable and create a movie based on Alan Moore's Watchmen. The story behind these failed films is, in my opinion, absolutely fascinating, and in this video, I want to explain the history behind several of these short-lived superhero projects, discuss the behind-the-scenes factors that led to each one never seeing the light of day, and consider how things would have changed if any of these projects would have found their way onto the screens. Before we continue though, just a quick reminder to leave a like on this video if you enjoy it, and subscribe to Owen Likes Comics so you don't miss out on any future videos. There are arguably no two single names bigger in the world of comics than Batman and Superman. Ever since their creations in the late 1930s, the duo have become cornerstones of the superhero medium, bringing it to the forefront of popular culture in comic books, television, and even film. Ever since Richard Donner brought the Man of Steel to the big screen in 1978, these two characters have pioneered the comic book movie genre. With the success of Donner's films and Christopher Reeve's iconic portrayal of Superman, not only spawning multiple sequels, but also Tim Burton's 1989 Batman film, a movie which shed the camp of the 60s Batman TV series and brought the Cape Crusader to the height of mainstream success. With the storied history that both characters have had on the big screen, it's almost surprising that it took so long for the pair to finally meet. And while 2016's Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice did finally bring these two characters together, it wasn't actually the first attempt at making this type of film. In fact, over a decade earlier, Warner Brothers were hard at work at developing Batman versus Superman, with multiple scripts written, actors targeted to play each role, and marketing in place in the studio's other high-profile films. So in this video, I want to discuss the history behind this failed Batman Superman film, explain the state of the pair's cinematic franchises during the early 2000s, and how this ambitious and ahead-of-its-time movie was first conceived, and then ultimately what went wrong behind the scenes, and why this fascinating alternate version of Batman v Superman man never saw the light of day. The Superman film franchise that had exploded onto the big screen in 1978, wowing audiences with the promise of you'll believe a man can fly, had faded into obscurity by the late 1980s, following the monumental failure of Superman 4 The Quest for Peace. And whilst Canon Films initially attempted to course correct with a fifth film, it soon became clear that this franchise was beyond salvaging. As such, in 1993, Warner Brothers purchased the film rights from Canon and attempted to produce their own Superman reboot, hiring Tim Burton to direct and Nicolas Cage to take on the iconic role. But this project failed to materialise. However, it was around the time that this film fell apart that Warner Brothers' ongoing Batman franchise had begun to experience similar problems. You see, the fourth entry into the Batman series, 1997's Batman and Robin, was met with widespread criticism upon its release, causing the studio to shelve plans for a fifth instalment and instead work on retooling the character. 
As such, Batman and Superman were both on cinematic hiatus, and remained so until 1999, when Warner Brothers' new head, Alan Horn, promised that the studio would release five tentpole feature films per year, intending to revive the iconic heroes to help accomplish this goal. As a result, various ideas for films involving these two characters were pitched with Andrew Kevin Walker, then best known as the screenwriter of David Fincher's Seven, submitting a treatment for a film that would star both heroes. Warner Brothers were intrigued by the notion of combining these two separate franchises, and as such, took Walker's script and hired Akiva Goldsman to rewrite it into a full-fledged Batman vs Superman film. In June of 2002, Goldsman completed his draft of the screenplay, as Wolfgang Peterson, who was recently coming off the success of 1997's Air Force One, was hired to direct. A 2004 release date was set soon after, as the casting search got underway, with a number of actors, including Colin Farrell, Jude Law, Johnny Depp, and Paul Walker, being considered for either lead role, before Christian Bale, who was also in talks to join Darren Aronofsky's Batman Year One film, was a approached to play The Dark Knight, whilst Josh Hartnett was offered the role of Superman. And although neither actor were officially cast, it did seem as if everything was falling to place for this film. Warner Brothers had set out plans to begin principal photography in early 2003, aiming for a five to six month shoot, and anticipation for this film was genuinely high within the studio. It appeared after years in the cinematic wilderness that Batman and Superman were finally set to make their triumphant return to the big screen. However, as we know, this film never came to fruition, and the reasons as to why it fell apart might be found in its screenplay. Goldsman's draft, dated June 21st, 2002, was a far darker and more somber film than you might expect. It would completely forego retelling either character's origin stories, and instead throw us deep into both heroes' careers. Right from the very beginning, we learn that Bruce has not been Batman for five years, following the deaths of Robin, Alfred, and Commissioner Gordon, and instead chose to lead a normal life with his fiancée, Elizabeth Miller. Much of the first portion of the script is dedicated to Bruce and Miller's wedding, with notable guests such as Barbara Gordon, who has now become the Commissioner of Gotham, and Clark Kent as Bruce's best man. While the wedding is a rare moment of joy for Bruce Wayne, the honeymoon proves to be short-lived, as Elizabeth is shockingly killed by the Joker, who Bruce had long assumed to be dead. The death of Elizabeth leads to Bruce once again becoming Batman, attempting to discover just how the Joker has returned from the death, and attempting to exact revenge for the death of his wife. Meanwhile, Superman has also experienced personal hardships in recent years, being recently divorced from Lois Lane, and returning to Smallville to reconnect with Lana Lang. However, once Clark learns about what has happened to Bruce and his quest for revenge, he attempts to confront his longtime friend and reason with him, only to discover that Batman is dead set on killing the Joker, and threatens Clark if he attempts to stop him. Unable to empathise with Batman, Superman instead confronts Lex Luthor, who is being held in prison, about his possible involvement in Elizabeth's death. As Batman ambushes the Joker and the pair begin to fight, with Bruce's anger taking control of him, struggling to contain the urge to finally kill his enemy. Superman arrives though before he can, telling Bruce that in order to murder the Joker, he'll first have to go through him. Now, this leads to a rather epic in stature fight between the two heroes, with Batman revealing a kryptonite laced battle suit designed purposefully to take down the Man of Steel. As the pair tumble throughout the city, Superman uses his freeze breath to destroy Batman's new armour, and in return, Bruce shoots him with a kryptonite arrow, immobilising him. With Superman down, Batman once again apprehends the Joker, beating him down senselessly and preparing to finally kill him. With Bruce's hand gripped around the Joker's throat, the Clown Prince of Crime reveals the truth behind Elizabeth's death that the entire thing was actually orchestrated by Lex Luthor, who cloned both the Joker and Elizabeth in order to set in motion a plan that would see the Dark Knight in anger kill Superman. Batman, shaken by this revelation, eventually chooses not to kill the Joker, and as Superman gets to his feet witnessing Bruce's decision, Lex emerges in his own armoured battle suit, disappointed that his plan had failed, and declaring that he must now kill both of them. 
Superman and Batman then team up to fight Lex, unable to withstand the power of his suit on their own. Eventually, the duo manage to work together and defeat Luther, with the three tumbling from a balcony before Superman is able to catch Batman, leaving Lex to fall to his apparent death. With the day now saved, Batman and Superman reconcile and make amends, with Bruce thanking him for not allowing him to kill the Joker and succumb to his worst urges. The pair embrace and Batman asks Superman if he wants to grab a beer, with Clark joyfully replying that he'd prefer a soda. As the two heroes put away all the pain and hardship they've endured throughout the last number of years and finally share a laugh as the credits roll. Honestly, having read the original Batman v Superman script when researching this video, I genuinely find a lot of the ideas within it to be fascinating. One of the things that stood out to me most when reading it was that despite the fact that Warner Brothers were looking at actors in their 20s to play Bruce Wayne and Clark Kent, they were both characterised in the script as being noticeably older. It honestly makes me wonder if the original intention behind this film was to serve as a loose sequel to the previous Batman's Superman movies, mostly due to the fact that major Batman characters such as Alfred and the Joker were dead in the continuity of this film. Now, while some of these aspects from the previous Batman and Superman films may have been referenced in Goldsman's script, it should be noted that tonally, this film would have been a massive deviation from any of the films that had come before it. In a lot of ways, this screenplay feels like the antithesis to films like Batman and Robin and Superman for the Quest for Peace. It's a very somber and depressing story that, while it does have its fair share of fantastical elements, grounds both lead characters in pain and tragedy. Akiva Goldsman actually discussed this in a recent interview, stating that, We were in prep and it was the darkest thing you've ever seen. It started with Alfred's funeral and Bruce has fallen in love and renounced being Batman. The Joker kills his wife and then you discover it was all a lie, just that the love itself was constructed by the Joker to break Bruce. It was a time where you would be able to get these sort of stories together in script form, but they couldn't quite land in the world. Despite these intentions though, this version of Batman vs Superman never saw the light of day. Now, while filming was set for 2003, the cameras never actually rolled for this highly anticipated Clash of the Titans, with Warner Brothers putting the film on the back burner in favour of standalone reboots for both Batman and Superman. David Hughes, in his book Tales from Development Hell, actually cites the coinciding production of J.J. Abrams' Superman flyby film as a major factor in BVS's collapse. He writes that, On the 5th of July, alias creator J.J. Abrams had turned in the first 88 pages of a new standalone Superman script, designed to be the first of a trilogy. Bob Brassel, a senior vice president for production at the studio, called producer John Peters, urging him to read the work in progress. Abrams delivered the remaining 50 pages of the script in mid-July, just as Spider-Man began its amazing assault on box office records, suggesting that light and airy, not dark and powerful, was the way to go with superhero flicks. As a result, Abrams' pitch for a standalone Superman film was fast-tracked by Warner Brothers, with President Alan Horn announcing soon after that the studio planned to focus on reintroducing both characters in their own individual films, telling The Hollywood Reporter, I'd like to think that each character will evolve so much that when we have Batman vs Superman, the meeting of the two will feel more organic. The plans for standalone movies eventually morphed into 2005's Batman Begins and 2006's Superman Returns, and by the time that both films were released in cinemas, the very notion of a crossover film between these two icons seemed like that of a bygone era. Obviously, Batman vs Superman did eventually make its way to the big screen, serving as the follow-up to 2013's Man of Steel, the reboot of the Superman franchise after the mixed response to Returns. But while a similar project to this did eventually come to fruition, it's fascinating to think that in 2004, a very different Batman Superman movie was almost made. This film would have served as the grand cinematic return for both characters, and possibly could have prevented films like Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight series from even being made, or at least dampened the significance of this more grounded take on the Cape Crusader. Looking back at what might have been some 15 years later, I find 
find it interesting to envisage just how different things could have been if this movie saw the light of day. In a lot of ways, Goldsman and Walker's BVS feels like a strange midpoint between the Tim Burton and Richard Donner eras of DC's films and the modern era ushered in by filmmakers like Nolan and Zack Snyder. It incorporates aspects of both eras of storytelling and it's genuinely hard not to wonder what the response would have been if this film had hit theatres in 2004. We will never know the answer for sure, but I think it's fair to say that the landscape of comic book movies would have been drastically changed. Maybe a follow-up film to this would have introduced the Justice League, years before Marvel's now iconic Avengers film was even conceived. Or maybe it would have failed to meet audiences' expectations and set the futures of Batman and Superman on the big screen back by another number of years. In the end though, as intriguing as this failed film is, it's hard not to think that things ultimately turned out for the best. But as Batman and Superman stand shoulder to shoulder once again in Zack Snyder's Justice League, much like they have in the comics for generations, it's fun to think about how things almost could have turned out so differently, and ponder just what could have been if the original Batman vs Superman film had made its way to the big screen. Wonder Woman is one of the most well-known and popular superheroes in the entire world. Ever since her first appearance in the pages of October 1941's All-Star Comics number 8, she has continued to inspire generations as a shining example of heroism and equality. In the 79 years since her creation, Diana Prince has been brought to life in a variety of different mediums, from live action TV shows to the ever popular DC animated series and even big screen blockbusters. However, there is one particular version of this character that has always intrigued me, one brought to life a decade ago that has seemingly been long forgotten about, that being the pilot for NBC's Wonder Woman TV series. This pilot, which saw Adrian Palicki portray the iconic hero, serves as a fascinating look into what might have been, an alternate world where the stories of the Princess of Themyscira were played out on the small screen. So in this video, I want to dive into the history of this short-lived series and explain how NBC almost brought Wonder Woman back to life on television, as well as what went wrong, and ultimately why this series never saw the light of day. Before we dive into the history of this failed Wonder Woman TV series though, I think it's worth acknowledging and overviewing the history of the character on screen, and how previous adaptations of Diana Prince paved the way for this attempted series. The first attempt at bringing the character to life came in 1967, when hot off the heels of the success of ABC's Batman show, producer William Dozier commissioned a pilot script for a series entitled Who's Afraid of Diana Prince. The pilot, while never broadcast, starred Ellie Wood Walker as Diana and Linda Harrison as her Wonder Woman alter ego, with the show focusing more on Diana's civilian life than her superheroics. While this series was never greenlit, a Wonder Woman TV movie was commissioned in 1974, with Kathy Lee Cosby playing the titular role. This film, intended as a pilot for a future television show, ultimately failed to resonate with audiences and the studio, leading to a more true-to-form TV series being commissioned the following year, with Linda Carter taking over the iconic role. Carter's portrayal of Wonder Woman would go on to become iconic, bringing the character to life between 1975 and 1979. While she had yet to receive a big budget motion picture like her Trinity cohorts, Batman and Superman, the show's success and legacy in the decades after it concluded meant that the character had proven to resonate with audiences on television, and it was this fact that encouraged NBC to bring Wonder Woman back to small screens in 2011. In October 2010, Warner Brothers Television began working with David E. Kelly to pitch a new Wonder Woman TV series to major television networks. While the initial pitches proved unsuccessful, they were eventually greenlit a pilot by NBC, with Jeffrey Reiner hired to direct in February 2011, with Adrian Palicki cast in the titular role soon after. 
Almost as soon as production began on this pilot though, did controversy seem to emerge, with The Hollywood Reporter releasing a first look at Diana's costume for the show, which would eventually be changed due to fan backlash. Soon after, the show's supporting cast began to take shape. Elizabeth Hurley was cast as the primary villain, Veronica Kale, Tracy Thomas as Diana's personal assistant, Etta Candy, and perhaps most interestingly, Pedro Pascal as Ed Indelicato, Wonder Woman's liaison to the local police. The pilot episode of this series aimed to introduce us to the status quo of this Wonder Woman TV series, reinventing the character in the vein of some of Kelly's previous television shows, with the tone and style of the episode closely resembling shows such as Ally McBeal. In this show, Wonder Woman is a vigilante crime fighter in LA, as well as a successful businesswoman under her alias Diana Themyscira. You can tell from this pilot alone that the show was going to heavily emphasise the professional and interpersonal drama in Diana's life, as she balances the corporate world, being a superhero, and everyday life troubles as well. And while it's a somewhat unconventional way of approaching this character overall, the episode did a somewhat decent job of establishing the world that this show would exist in. While it was far from the traditional depiction of the character that fans had seen from the comics or the Linda Carter series decades earlier, there was certainly some form of promise about this show. Sure, the pilot felt rough around the edges attempting to find what the series' identity and style would become, but everyone involved in it truly felt like it was going to develop into something interesting and successful. That is, until it didn't. On the 12th of May 2011, NBC announced that they would not be picking up the Wonder Woman pilot for a full season. While the official reasoning as to why they passed on the show was never outright stated, it's assumed that the controversy surrounding the show during the pilot's production, specifically the backlash regarding Diana's costume, as well as the mixed responses to the pilot itself, meant that the studio didn't believe the show could succeed long term. It's worth keeping in mind that at the time of the pilot's creation, superhero TV shows weren't as popular and commonplace as they are today. And this attempted Wonder Woman series even predated shows such as Arrow, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Daredevil, with the only successful modern comic book TV show around during this time being Smallville. It's fair to say that if this pilot had been commissioned today, irrespective of its quality, it's likely that it would have at least been given one season, as the name value of the character alone would likely have ensured it performed well enough to justify the initial run. However, in 2011, superhero television shows were just a far bigger gamble than they are today, and to NBC at this time, the risk was just far higher than the potential reward. With the hopes of bringing this Wonder Woman series to life dashed, Warner Brothers began to move forward with other projects for the character. Notably, following the success of Arrow after its October 2012 premiere, Warner Brothers Television and The CW announced they were working on a script for a Wonder Woman prequel series entitled Amazon, with a pilot script written by Alan Heinberg. Despite rewrites on the script taking place in 2013 and casting searches underway, with Being Human star Amy Manson rumoured for the role of Diana, this series also never came to fruition, as both Warner Brothers and The CW instead focused on developing a different Arrow spin-off series in the form of The Flash. With another show failing to get off the ground, Warner Brothers instead decided to concentrate their efforts on developing a Wonder Woman feature film. As such, in December 2013, Gal Gadot was cast to play Wonder Woman in the live-action DC film Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, with Patty Jenkins hired to direct a Wonder Woman solo film the following year. Released in May of 2017, Wonder Woman would go on to become a huge success for the studio, grossing over $800 million and receiving a largely positive response from critics. The success of this film saw the production of a sequel, 2020's Wonder Woman 1984, which would interestingly see Pedro Pascal return to the Wonder Woman universe, this time as the villainous Maxwell Lord. 
And while Wonder Woman has gone on to become a huge success on the big screen, it's interesting to think about how different things could have been if the character had been brought back to television a decade earlier, and how both the fate of the character and the wider landscape of DC's live action films would have changed. Although I don't believe the pilot would have blossomed into an all-time great superhero TV show, I do genuinely believe that if it had been commissioned a few years later, the chances of it being given a full season would have been a lot higher. Only one year after the pilot's creation, Arrow was brought to television screens, while Marvel Studios' The Avengers was released in cinemas, creating a massive superhero frenzy that still dominates pop culture today. If Wonder Woman was commissioned in a post-Avengers world, it's hard to imagine it not being greenlit. Adrian Palicki, who starred as Diana in the pilot, shares these sentiments, telling Entertainment Weekly that it was devastating when it didn't go. It was so big. I feel like maybe if it had been made one or two years later, it would have been a shoo-in. Despite this though, those who worked on bringing this pilot to life have spoken openly and honestly about this failed series, with David E. Kelly telling The Hollywood Reporter that, I still believe it's viable for a television series. I think it's right to do it. We made mistakes with ours. My only regret is we were never given a chance to correct them. We had a lot that was right about it and a great cast. In time, we could have fixed what we had done wrong. We just didn't get the chance. All my series have been a work in progress to a certain extent, where you figure them out by episodes 3, 4 and 5. This one actually gelled sooner than any that I have had in the past. We would have gotten there, and I wish we were afforded a little more time. And while that time may never have been afforded and Wonder Woman's future eventually lied on the big screen, I nevertheless find this pilot to be deeply fascinating. That said, I ultimately think the demise of this series was for the best. While it's certainly not the worst comic book adaptation that someone has attempted to bring to life on the small screen, it's also far from the best, and nowhere near the level of quality and significance that a character as popular and influential as Wonder Woman deserves. And if this show had aired and continued to garner the mixed response that the pilot episode received, it's very possible we'd ultimately never have gotten the fantastic and inspiring version of the character that we have today. The Amazing Spider-Man film series has always felt like a missed opportunity to me. Ever since the series was announced back in 2010, following the cancellation of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4, this new take on the iconic Marvel superhero never managed to quite reach the high level of potential that it clearly had. Despite the tremendous casting of actors Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone, and genuinely tremendous moments sprinkled throughout both 2012's The Amazing Spider-Man and its 2014 sequel, I think it's fair to say that for one reason or another, this franchise never managed to live up to its expectations. In a previous video, we discussed the history of how the Amazing Spider-Man film series came to be, the production of both movies, and how the lukewarm response to The Amazing Spider-Man 2, coupled with its underwhelming box office performance, made Sony Pictures scrap their plans for a sequel, in favour of teaming up with Marvel to bring Peter Parker over to the MCU, with Tom Holland donning the iconic red and blue costume in 2016's Captain America Civil War and beyond. However, the decision to scrap these plans extended far beyond a sequel to The Amazing Spider-Man 2, as between 2013 and 2015, Sony Pictures had not only already outlined plans for An Amazing Spider-Man 3, but they were also actively developing a number of spin-off projects set in the same continuity, aiming to create a Spider-Man-centric cinematic universe that would become a box office juggernaut just like the MCU had. Now, while these plans obviously never came to fruition, the history behind projects like Venom, The Sinister Six, Silver and Black, and The Amazing Spider-Man 3 are truly fascinating. And in this video, I want to explain the story of just how they all came to be, discuss the original ideas and plans for each of these films, and the factors that ultimately led to them either being drastically changed during their development, or never seeing the light of day entirely, and how this once ambitious plan for an amazing Spider-Man cinematic universe ultimately faded away into obscurity.
2012's The Amazing Spider-Man proved to be a modest success for Sony Pictures. Despite a quick turnaround following the demise of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man series, the film under the direction of Mark Webb was largely received well and made a respectable profit upon its July 2012 release, encouraging the studio that there was a clear future for this new take on the classic hero. As Sony quickly put in place plans for a sequel, re-signing the likes of Webb, Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone to new multi-film deals, something else happened in 2012 that I think had a fundamental impact on the studio's plans for future Spider-Man films, The Avengers. You see, when the original Spider-Man film was in development, the Marvel Cinematic Universe was still very much in its infancy, with only Iron Man, The Incredible Hulk and Iron Man 2 being released. And although it started to become clear that Marvel had major plans for their live-action motion pictures, the extent of this didn't become fully clear until 2012, when the company united all of their burgeoning cinematic heroes into one epic team-up film. Upon its May 2012 release, The Avengers became a cultural phenomenon, grossing over $1.5 billion and launching the MCU into the stratosphere, forever changing the way that major Hollywood studios approached franchise filmmaking. As a result, practically every other studio attempted to replicate Marvel's formula in the aftermath of The Avengers, and Sony was certainly no exception to this. As The Amazing Spider-Man 2 was concluding its post production, Sony Pictures issued a press release in December 2013, outlining the studio's plans to develop a brain trust of writers, directors and producers who would help turn the amazing film series into a full-fledged shared cinematic universe, naming the likes of Mark Webb, Drew Goddard, Alex Kurtzman and Roberto Orsi as all being part of this group, alongside senior producers Avi Arad and Matt Tolmach. In addition, it was soon announced that two projects were being actively developed, Venom, then to be written and directed by Kurtzman and The Sinister Six, written and directed by Goddard. Although the building blocks for this approach would be seen throughout The Amazing Spider-Man 2, with the film not only introducing both Electro and the Green Goblin, but its post credit scene seemingly setting up The Sinister Six, the planned Amazing Spider-Man 3 was to truly be the bridge between the previously standalone Spider-Man films and Sony's new interconnected universe. Plans to make a third Amazing Spider-Man film were announced as early as June 2013, with Amazing Spider-Man 2 screenwriters Roberto Orsi, Alex Kurtzman and Jeff Pinker all signing on to pen the new screenplay. The movie would be set for release in June 2016, with a planned fourth instalment in the series being set for a 2018 release. Mark Webb, who was once again set to direct The Amazing Spider-Man 3, discussed plans for where the franchise was set to go next, specifically highlighting a cut scene from the second movie that hinted at the return of Norman Osborn. As Webb explained in an interview with Den of Geek, Chris Cooper was going to come back and play the goblin. We were going to freeze his head and then he was going to be brought back to life. And then there was that character called the gentleman. We had some notions about how to do it, but I think maybe we were thinking too far ahead when we started building in those things. But it was a fun exercise. I look back very fondly on those days. While the scene is yet to be officially released, the original post credit scene for The Amazing Spider-Man 2 would have seen the gentleman revive Norman's cryogenically frozen head, leading to his transformation into the Green Goblin in the subsequent film. Likewise, Andrew Garfield would later discuss his involvement in the third film's development, explaining to Uprox in 2015 that, I was actually starting to workshop ideas with Alex Kurtzman, who was going to be writing it. We thought to kind of start from the base level, the foundational level of where have we left Peter and where do we want to see him go and what's logical? And how do we build upon where we left off with this deep, desperate moment with Gwen? So yeah, we got to some pretty heavy places and I was really excited to kind of explore it and be involved on the ground level like that. Further details for The Amazing Spider-Man 3's plot would be revealed by Dennis Leary, who played Captain George Stacy in the previous two films. In an interview with IGN, Leary explained that the movie would see Peter adapt the spider serum, combining his father's research with the lizard formula developed by Dr. Kurt Connors in an attempt to try and resurrect the dead, in particular both Gwen and George Stacy. It was also suggested that Peter's attempts to revive the pair would lead to Gwen becoming Carnage, seemingly setting up a clash with Venom in his own spin-off film. Although it is uncertain just how far into development this version of The Amazing Spider-Man 3 got, it's interesting to note that a very different approach to continuing this story was proposed in November 2014. As part of an internal email sent to various Sony executives, the notion of making a prequel film to The Amazing Spider-Man 2 was proposed, with this movie aiming to fill in some of the gaps that existed between the two Amazing Spider-Man film stories. To quote the email verbatim, In a never-before move, we do 
a prequel to Amazing Spider-Man 2. Gwen is still alive, Norman is still alive, but increasingly getting sicker. He has seen and heard of Spider-Man slash Peter Parker following the events of Amazing Spider-Man 1, and having seen that he was wounded by the police shooter, has hired a Russian big game hunter, Craven, to track him down and bring him in. Norman believes that in Peter's blood is the key to cure him. Craven ultimately captures Peter slash Spidey and supplies Norman with vials of his blood. Norman, in an attempt to synthesize a cure, actually ends up becoming the original goblin and transforms like the ultimate version. Spidey and Gobby battle it out, with Gobby running away weak, and which leads us to the frail state that we see Norman in Amazing Spider-Man 2. Whether this film would have been released as The Amazing Spider-Man 3, The Amazing Spider-Man 1.5, or a Craven the Hunter movie is unclear. Nevertheless, the plans for a third Amazing Spider-Man film soon hit a sudden stopgap, as in July 2014, Andrew Garfield was supposed to appear at a Sony panel alongside the company's president Kaz Harai in Rio de Janeiro, where Harai was set to publicly announce The Amazing Spider-Man 3. For one reason or another, Garfield failed to attend the event, and Sony's executives were unhappy and even discussed moving on with their plans for more Spider-Man movies without him. It was actually around this time though that Amy Pascal had began meeting with Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige. You see, Feige and Pascal's partnership began during the final stages of production for The Amazing Spider-Man 2, when Sony reached out to him seeking his thoughts on the film's rough cut. After this, Sony were keen on bringing Feige in as a producer. Given both his immense success as the architect behind the MCU and his involvement in producing Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy. With Feige eventually presenting the idea of Sony and Marvel collaborating on a new Spider-Man reboot, this one set within the MCU. While Pascal initially refused even throwing a sandwich at Feige when he proposed this idea, the combination of The Amazing Spider-Man 3's troubled development, the uncertainty around Garfield's status, and the fact that this franchise hadn't yet performed to box office expectations, eventually led The Amazing Spider-Man 3 to be scrapped completely in February 20. 15, as Sony and Marvel formally announced their new partnership and their intentions to reboot the beloved superhero once again. Although the announcement of Sony's partnership with Marvel Studios saw plans for a third Amazing Spider-Man film be cancelled, the studio remained keen on developing their other spin-off projects. In particular, Drew Goddard's Sinister Six film continued to be worked on throughout 2014 and 2015. As noted previously, Goddard was part of Sony's brain trust for future Spider-Man projects, and following the success of his directorial debut, 2011's The Cabin in the Woods, he was officially appointed as both writer and director of the Sinister to six in April 2014. Immediately after, Goddard got to work penning the movie's screenplay, with Avi Arad noting in an internal email in May that he had not only read an early draft of Goddard's script, but found it incredibly exciting. In a later email, Goddard would outline the overall story and theme for his Sinister Six project, stating that, We're doing something different. It's time to celebrate the bad guys for once. We're inspired by the classic team mission of movies. Dirty Dozen, Magnificent Seven, Guns of Navarone. We want that spirit, that swagger. If the Spider-Man franchise is the Beatles, then we're the Sex Pistols. By this point, it became clear that this Sinister Six film wouldn't necessarily pick up where The Amazing Spider-Man 2 left off, instead being a more loose continuation of the franchise less centred around Oscorp. Instead of Harry or Norman Osborn uniting the team, Goddard's film would have been centred around a lineup consisting of Doctor Octopus, as well as the Vulture, the Sandman, Mysterio, Black Cat, and perhaps most shockingly, Spider-Man. While extensive details on Goddard's pitch remain unavailable, what is known is that the film wouldn't actually be about the Sinister Six fighting Spider-Man. Instead, the villains would team up with their longtime foe in order to stop a larger threat found in the Savage Land, with both Gog and the arrival of the symbiotes being pitched to be the film's main villains at different points. At one point, the idea was even discussed of having Peter wear the black suit during a climactic fight between the Sinister Six and Carnage, before passing the symbiote on to Eddie Brock to set up Alan 
Alex Kurtzman's Venom movie. In particular, Goddard highlighted Doc Ock and the Sandman as being the two key characters in his film, with Otto Octavius' role being compared to that of Michael Corleone in the Godfather trilogy. According to Goddard, much of the film would centre around the relationship between Otto and Peter, as the villain seemingly gets a chance at redemption when teaming up with the hero to save the world, only to cement himself at the movie's conclusion as a through and through villain, highlighting the tragic nature of his character and his relationship with Spider-Man. Likewise, Goddard described his rendition of the Sandman as being the heart of the movie, claiming that his character would be pure id and the anarchic enthusiast of the team. Although no actors were ever formally cast, several names had been considered for various roles. In particular, Sony executives expressed interest in casting a high-profile actor to play Otto Octavius, with the likes of Matt Damon, Denzel Washington, Daniel Craig and Matthew McConaughey all being proposed at different points in the film's development. Sandman, however, seemed to be written with actor Tom Hardy in mind, with Goddard directly referencing Hardy's Sandman becoming a Godzilla-esque kaiju in the film's climax. Originally, The Sinister Six was outlined for release in either 2017 or 2018, intended to follow up on The Amazing Spider-Man 3. However, soon after it became clear that that film's production was encountering problems, The Sinister Six was moved up to November 2016, with plans to shoot the film in Vancouver being made in late 2014. Despite these plans, The Sinister Six movie never actually made it in front of cameras. While the project did remain alive following Sony's deal with Marvel, with the studio even at one point considering including Captain America in the film, the plug was officially pulled in November 2015. In the years since, Goddard has discussed his idea for the movie, as well as regret that he was never able to bring it to life. In an October 2018 interview with The Playlist, he stated that Sinister Six was really fun. I wouldn't have done it had I not thought there was a real opportunity to do something different and exciting and just flat out bananas. It was very much me and a much more commercial version of the Cabin in the Woods mentality. The punk rock mentality that led to Cabin is very much at the core of Sinister Six. Despite Goddard's enthusiasm though and Sony's optimism about this film, I think it's clear that this specific version of The Sinister Six wouldn't have been without its issues, as not only did it seem to contradict what had been established in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, but I don't think the studio fully understood the property that they were seeking to adapt. At their best, The Sinister Six are an ensemble of villains banding together to take out their common enemy, Spider-Man, and while the hero has been forced to reluctantly team with them on several different occasions, most Notably, in Brian Michael Bendis and Mark Bagley's Ultimate Six miniseries, Goddard's pitch feels more reminiscent of something like 2016's Suicide Squad than a true depiction of this iconic team of villains. I don't think Sony ever truly knew what their idea for the Sinister Six was, other than the fact that they clearly wanted a team-up movie in the same manner as Marvel's Avengers. And given the rich history of this ensemble and Spider-Man's legendary rogues gallery, it makes this project's demise ultimately seem for the best. Although The Amazing Spider-Man 3 and The Sinister Six were arguably the two most well-known projects being developed by Sony Pictures at this time, the studio had actually been working on several other films to be part of their amazing cinematic universe. Perhaps the most intriguing of all of these projects was one titled Glass Ceiling, that would be a team-up film based around several female Spider-Man characters. This project, while not part of Sony's initial December 2013 announcement, was first discussed in internal emails in April 2014, when Drew Goddard suggested to Amy Pascal about developing a film based around Black Cat and Silver Sable, tapping up screenwriter Lisa Joy to work on the film. Joy would later submit her outline in July 2014. The following month, Deadline would cover Sony's plans for a female-led Spider-Man team-up film, stating that the movie intended to release in 2017 and was likely to include characters such as Black Cat, Spider-Woman, Firestar and Stunner, in addition to Silver Sable. Although no actors were ever cast for any of these roles, several had been suggested internally by various Sony executives. In particular, Amy Pascal and Lisa Joy were apparently both keen on casting Rose Byrne as the Silver Sable, while Pascal also proposed Gillian Bell as Spider-Woman. Additionally, the idea of bringing Gwen Stacy back in some form in this film was also discussed, having her become a Spider-Girl type character, which is particularly noteworthy as these ideas were conceived before Spider-Gwen first appeared in comics in September 2014. In a more detailed outline submitted by Joy in October of that year, we learn what the film's plot would have been. As she explains, 
Silver Sable wants nothing more than to be in the Wild Pack, but her father has her heading up recruitment. She's frustrated, doesn't realize her father is trying to teach her something about beating that she will learn later. Silver Sable's father and the Wild Pack are taken out early on along with Spider-Man by the villain, possibly Doc Ock trying to find an alive version of his wife in a parallel universe. Our heroes are the ones who are left behind, those who are underestimated. A big theme of the movie, it is up to Sable to assemble her own Wild Pack and stop Mr. Negative and Ock or whoever opened the portal. In addition to this outline, several more character details would be revealed. Specifically, Joy had suggested making Gwen the Spider-Woman character, coming from the same alternate reality that Doc Ock was trying to reach. Visualising a moment in the film's third act, where a Spider-Man-like character would appear and rescue the heroes, only to unmask and reveal it to be Gwen Stacy. From here, glass ceiling status would become unclear, as the Sony Marvel partnership was announced in early 2015, and it caused the studio to re-evaluate the plans for a Spider-Man centric shared universe, with The Wrap reporting that the film had been officially cancelled in November 2015. Despite this though, the idea of doing a Black Cat and Silver Sable movie persisted, with Sony eventually reviving the project in 2017, even going as far as to hiring Gina Prince Bythewood to direct the film. However, less than a year later, it appeared that the project had been scrapped once again, with Sony instead considering reworking the project to be two separate films or adapting it into a television show, depending on the success of their current standalone projects such as the Venom movies. On the subject of Venom though, it's no secret that a spin-off film featuring the Lethal Protector had been a priority for Sony for many years, with plans to do a standalone film for the character dating back to the production of 2007 Spider-Man 3. Now, Alex Kurtzman was originally hired to helm the film in December 2013, with the project at one point being titled Venom Carnage, with a release date set for late 2017. However, while Kurtzman was initially attached, at one point Chronicle and Fantastic Four director Josh Trank was also approached to direct the Venom film. As Trank would explain in an interview with Comic Book Movie, About a month after Chronicle came out, because I was doing all these general meetings with everybody, I met with Amy Pascal and the senior executives at Sony. It was a really cool meeting and Amy Pascal is really sweet and everybody there is really cool. They loved Chronicle and wanted to find a project that made sense. And Amy brought up Venom out of nowhere. I'm a huge fan of Todd McFarlane in general and Venom was just a character I've always loved. I immediately thought about the mask. This could be like a really cool synthesis of everything about the mask that I loved, but infused into the lore of this iconic Marvel character. We were off to the races. We made a deal for it and I was really excited. I thought this was an opportunity to make something really charactery, uncomfortable, and break ground in terms of having this super nuanced, uncomfortable character story with the branding of a massive four quadrant superhero film. We turned in the treatment and they didn't like it. That kind of says everything. With Trank's pitch being rejected, Sony began to explore other ideas for the Venom film. In October 2014, an alternate project was pitched by Hannah Minghella, this one based on the Flash Thompson Agent Venom storyline that had recently begun in the Amazing Spider-Man comic series. However, it doesn't appear that this pitch got any further than merely being suggested, as in 2015, Venom was reworked to now be a film set outside of the Amazing Spider-Man continuity, eventually casting Tom Hardy to play Eddie Brock, and the movie was eventually released in 2018. Perhaps the most interesting and ambitious idea that was considered at Sony during this period though was actually the return of Sam Raimi. As by November 2014, the studio had begun discussing ways to bring the filmmaker back to the franchise, even proposing developing either a Spider-Man 4 featuring the return of both Tobey Maguire and Kirsten Dunst, or a film with both Maguire and Garfield's respective Spider-Man. Internal emails from Sony executives revealed that the studio studio aimed to bring both Raimi and screenwriter David Cope back to the franchise. Although it remains unclear whether or not this idea was formally presented to either Raimi or Cope, I do find it fascinating that this idea was even proposed, as the idea of a Spider-Verse was back then very much in its infancy. Nevertheless, this idea seemed to be a backup plan in case the ongoing negotiations with Marvel Studios fell through. However, once the deal was finalised and plans to introduce an all-new version of Spider-Man, Spider-Man in Captain America Civil War was outlined, these plans, like many of Sony's other ambitious ideas, soon faded away into obscurity. 
Honestly, having gone back and looked at all of the various plans Sony had in place for their amazing Spider-Man cinematic universe, I find it absolutely fascinating to think about what might have been. Although I believe that things for the most part worked out for the best, with the Sony Marvel collaboration giving us not only a series of quality Spider-Man films, as well as team-ups with other beloved Marvel heroes, but it's also still allowed Sony to attempt their own standalone projects. With all of that said though, as someone who saw clear, untapped potential in the Amazing Spider-Man franchise, there is part of me that wishes that it found a way to continue. Admittedly, the ideas for the Amazing Spider-Man 3 that were being discussed don't necessarily fill me with a great deal of confidence, and neither do some of the other pitches being made internally by various studio executives. Nevertheless though, I do think there is a world where both a sequel to the Amazing Spider-Man 2 could have been made successfully, as well as the likes of a Sinister Six film, a Venom movie connected to Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man, and a female-led team up film. And while I do think the studio did put a team of talented writers and directors in place for all of these projects, I think their troubled productions are all signs of a larger problem within Sony during this period, as the studio seemed more focused on building a blockbuster shared universe than they did in ensuring their films met the level of quality fans had come to expect. The Amazing Spider-Man 2, a film designed to set up this larger universe, perfectly encapsulates this problem, as it's a movie filled with both incredible moments and equally rushed and poor ones, with the latter being often shoehorned in to set up future projects. And despite my optimism, it appears that if the Sony Marvel deal hadn't been made, that direction would have been the one that these proposed films would have likely gone down. Regardless though, I still think it's fun to imagine just what could have been, and how the landscape of superhero movies would have drastically changed changed if any or all of these films actually made it onto the big screen, and what the future would have potentially held for the gone too soon, amazing Spider-Man. The Batman film series has been a mainstay of popular cinema for many decades now, ever since Tim Burton's 1989 blockbuster, audiences have been continuously enthralled by The Dark Knight's adventures, whether it be Michael Keaton, Christian Bale, Ben Affleck, or someone else underneath the cowl. Batman has always been a wildly popular character in film, and that is partly what makes it so hard to believe the slump that the character found himself in during the late 1990s. You see, the series of films started by Burton in 89 had run themselves into the ground, and by the release of 1997's Batman and Robin, What killed the dinosaurs? The Ice Age! Warner Brothers were unsure as to what the future held for the Cape Crusader, if the character even had a future. In the years that followed, the studio attempted a number of different scripts and projects aiming to bring back the Batman film series, ranging from the dark, taxi driver-like take by Darren Aronofsky, to a Batman-Superman team-up movie that almost saw Josh Hartnett become the Man of Steel, this is why Superman works alone. But in this video, I want to touch on the immediate aftermath of Batman and Robin's critical and commercial failure, the impact it had on the Batman film series as a whole, and the two competing screenplays which promised to bring the Dark Knight back to his glory days. Batman Unchained, also commonly known as Batman Triumphant, and Batman Dark Knight. Batman and Robin was released into theatres on the 20th of June 1997, and quickly found itself becoming the final nail in the coffin of the Dark Knight cinematic franchise. While the loss of original director Tim Burton and the lukewarm response to 1995's Batman Forever had begun to disillusion audiences, it would be Batman and Robin's camp, frantic and toyetic nature that would ultimately drive them away for good. While the film did have a strong opening weekend, making an estimated $43 million domestically, Warner Brothers was soon resolved to the failure as the film grossed only $238 million worldwide. In comparison, its predecessor Batman Forever had made $336 million, and Marvel and Fox's X-Men film released just three years later would gross $296 million. In the aftermath of Batman and Robin's release though, director Joel Schumacher and producer Peter McGregor Scott did acknowledge the film's shortfalls, citing a rushed production schedule and a desire for the studio to make a more family-friendly product. However, the most surprising part about Batman and Robin's failure was that it genuinely caught Warner Brothers off guard, 
the studio was taken aback by the film's poor reception, having seen largely positive results from the film's early test screenings. And this proved a problem, as the studio had already begun work on a follow-up film, aiming for a 1999 release date. Schumacher had already signed up for his third film in the series, while screenwriter Mark Protasevich replaced Akiva Goldsman, who had penned the past two entries. Protasevich was approached by Warner Brothers to work on a new Batman movie the year prior, and by this point had all but completed his draft for the upcoming film. Now, he and Schumacher had met several times during the production of Batman and Robin, and discussed their mutual desire to move away from the overly camp nature of the previous two films, and instead explore more of the psychological aspect of the Batman character. This notion is evident in the pair's work, while Batman Unchained, as it was then known, did still carry over an element of the previous film's humour and family-friendly nature, it wasn't anywhere near as overbearing and loud as Batman and Robin, counterbalancing the camp with genuinely dark moments and a compelling story. Batman Unchained was to introduce the Scarecrow to the Batman film series, while also bringing in the recently created character of Harley Quinn, though depicted as the long-lost daughter of the Joker seeking revenge for her father's death in the original 1989 film, with Nicolas Cage and Courtney Love heavily eyed for the two roles. The script would see the pair of villains unite, and use Scarecrow's fear toxin to torment Batman and hold him to trial for the deaths of many of his rogues gallery, in what was described by Warner Brothers executives as the most expensive sequence ever written, the film was to include hallucinations of all of Batman's previous villains, including Jim Carrey's Riddler, Tommy Lee Jones' Two-Face, Danny DeVito's Penguin, and most surprisingly, even Jack Nicholson as the Joker. Protasevich wanted Batman to have to deal with the emotional guilt of his actions throughout the previous four movies, and by confronting his past demons, conquer his fear and emerge a better hero. And by doing this, Batman Unchained would serve as the culmination for the entire Batman franchise, and offer a sense of finality to both Schumacher and Burton's films. Ultimately, as the grand failure of Batman and Robin began to settle in at Warner Brothers, the studio quickly moved away from this project. While they weren't prepared to give up on Batman entirely, the studio executives felt that moving away from Schumacher would be the best thing for the series, and eventually scrapped Protasevich's script in favour of one penned by Lee Shapiro and Stephen Weiss, entitled Batman Dark Knight. Batman Dark Knight, awful title aside, was pitched by Shapiro to Warner Brothers executives in the summer of 1998, with the pair of writers attempting to pen a film which served as a follow-up to the existing Batman movies, while also being a clear move away from the tonal style of the Schumacher films. After a successful meeting with executive Greg Silverman, Warner Brothers greenlit Shapiro and Weiss's pitch, with the pair ultimately turning in the screenplay for Dark Knight, three months after their first meeting. Dark Knight, much like Batman Unchained, would see the villainous Scarecrow brought to the big screen, but few other similarities exist between the two projects. Here, we find a Bruce Wayne, still played by George Clooney, now retired, reclused, and distant from the now college student Dick Grayson, with Chris O'Donnell reprising his role. Now, Dick's ascendancy to adulthood and his stepping out of Batman's shadow was going to be an integral part of this film, with Dr. Jonathan Crane, Scarecrow's alias, depicted as Dick's college professor of psychology, suffering from a disease that prevented him from feeling physical pain. Now, Crane would eventually kidnap and experiment on Grayson in Arkham Asylum, while also transforming his colleague, Dr. Kurt Langstrom, into the villainous creature Man-Bat. This would begin a series of events that would force Batman back into action, as Man-Bat's murderous acts were being seen as to be committed by Batman. As you can see, the film took a much darker approach to the Batman series, introducing elements from the ever-popular 1987 graphic novel The Dark Knight Returns, while toying with some horror and psychological thriller aspects also. For example, when Shapiro described Scarecrow's characterization in the film, he stated that his sense of touch is off, so it's heightened his other senses, and it made him like a living Scarecrow. He gets physically scarred during a confrontation with Man-Bat, and that scarring of his face would become his mask. It becomes the stitches he puts on himself, and the catarizing of the wounds and all of that stuff. His face becomes the Scarecrow mask. 
It's clear that Shapiro and Wise had big intentions for this film, while also hoping that its success could spawn a new trilogy of Batman movies in its vein. The Hollywood Reporter note that future plans involve Dick's ascendancy to the role of Nightwing and the introduction of new villains such as Killer Croc, Clayface and Harley Quinn. However, despite handing in their final draft in late 1998, the screenwriters heard nothing back from Warner Brothers for some time, as the studio remained hesitant on which direction to take the Batman film series. Dark Knight ultimately lingered on in development hell until 2001, when Jeff Robinov was appointed producer for the Batman film franchise, scrapping the film in favour of moving away from any of the previous movies, instead evaluating the possibility of a Back to Basics reboot in the style of Frank Miller's Batman Year One. These series of movies that had existed since 1989 finally were laid to rest, and the Batman franchise lay dormant until 2005, as the aforementioned projects all failed to materialise, and ultimately paved the way for Christopher Nolan to reinvent the character and bring the hero back to the big screen in 2005's Batman Begins. Nevertheless, I find it fascinating to look at what might have been, and assess the different attempts made to breathe new life into this failing series in the aftermath of Batman and Robin. If either Unchained or Dark Knight had been made, it's fair to say that the Batman series would look wildly different today. Had they succeeded, it's very likely the studio would never have allowed for a filmmaker like Nolan to do such a drastically different take on the character. And if they failed, it very well could have killed the possibility of another Batman film altogether. In the end though, all we can do now is speculate, and imagine what could have been if either Batman Unchained or Batman Dark Knight had stepped in front of cameras in the late 1990s and how it would have affected the future of the live-action Batman adaptations. This may sound like a strange thing to say, but I am continuously fascinated by the movie Justice League. And as of this video's release, it's now been a full year since Justice League hit theatres, and yet I still find myself thinking about it constantly. The movie was poised to be the crowning jewel of Warner Brothers' attempts to launch a shared cinematic universe of DC properties, hoping that this film would be the same coming out party that Disney and Marvel's 2012 The Avengers was. But what we actually got was this. Oh uh, yeah, oh, something is definitely bleeding. Dressed like a bat. You're out of your mind, Bruce Wayne. And I get the exclusive. Yes, ma'am. Three boxes are, and I'll make it 30. Kalel, no! Here's the thing, though. It's common knowledge now that Justice League had a ton of behind the scenes production troubles. Warner Brothers and Zack Snyder clearly weren't on the same page in regards to their long term vision, with the studio possibly getting cold feet about the director's ambitions after the lukewarm reception to Batman v Superman. Snyder had to exit the project midway through production after the tragic death of his daughter and his replacement Joss Whedon, the same man who had helmed the Avengers, was brought in to finish Zack's job, but ended up making heavy and noticeable changes to the film. But with all of this said, I feel like the failure of Justice League isn't just on Snyder or Whedon or whoever, I think it's a real systemic problem in regards to how Warner Brothers has handled their comic book and movie properties over the last few years, and the root issue here with Justice League could actually be traced back a decade to even before the unofficially named DCEU was even a thing, during a period that many see as a great one for DC's comic book movies. So in this video, which is the beginning of a three-part series, I want to examine the history of the Justice League film project over the last decade. Right now though, we're going to specifically look at George Miller's failed Justice League Mortal film from 2007, and by attempting to understand why it didn't work, we can begin to learn in turn why this didn't work. Created in March of 1960 by Gardner Fox in Brave and the Bold number 28, 
The Justice League of America are DC Comics' flagship superhero team, initially made up of Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, The Flash, Aquaman, and Martian Manhunter. In a modern context, the Justice League still remains one of DC's most beloved properties, with tons of incredibly popular and seminal comic book stories, two hugely popular animated TV series, no shortage of feature-length animated movies, and a wide array of merchandising. So with this in mind, it is weird to think that it took Warner Brothers, who have owned DC Comics since 1989, so long to get this property off the ground and onto the big screen, instead mostly focusing on solo live-action features centred around Superman and Batman. The Batman film franchise in particular is incredibly noteworthy. After the critical failure of 1997's Batman and Robin, Warner Brothers began to slow down their production on superhero films, before Christopher Nolan brought the Cape Crusader back to the big screen in 2005 with Batman Begins, a much more grounded and comic accurate take on the early years of the Dark Knight, taking heavy inspiration from Frank Miller's graphic novel Batman Year One. With the success of Batman Begins, Warner Brothers began to develop a number of other superhero properties for live-action adaptations. In 2006, Brian Singer, the man who had launched the X-Men film series six years prior, brought Superman Returns, reintroducing the Man of Steel to the movie-going audience with this love letter to the Christopher Reeve era Superman. And with DC's two flagship properties back in the cultural zeitgeist, Warner Brothers began to discuss the possibility of uniting the League. In February 2007, WB announced that husband and wife duo Kieran and Michelle Mulroney had been hired to pen a screenplay for an upcoming Justice League film. The pair submitted their first draft of the film in June of that year, and Warner Brothers were so pleased with their work that they decided to fast track the project bringing in Lord of the Rings producer Barry Osborn to oversee the $220 million film, while aiming to secure Juno director Jason Reitman. However, the filmmaker ultimately passed on the project, which caused the studio then to approach Mad Max filmmaker George Miller, who signed on in September 2007. However, almost from the beginning, the project ran into major problems. For instance, one of the biggest stumbling blocks that it would have to overcome was regarding which versions of Batman and Superman that they would choose to use, and whether or not this film would be tied into Nolan and Singer's respective franchises. While a Superman Returns sequel seemed unlikely at this point, Nolan's follow-up to Begins The Dark Knight was already in pre-production, and the director appeared reluctant to allow his series to become incorporated and intertwined with this new Justice League film. Christian Bale, who portrayed Batman in Nolan's series, was somewhat outspoken about this, stating that in an interview with IESB.net while on the red carpet for 310 to Yuma, not only had he not been approached to reprise his role as the Cape Crusader, but he felt that the film shouldn't be released prior to Nolan's third and final installment in the series, stating that it'd be better if it doesn't tread on the toes of what we're doing, though I feel like it'd be better if it comes out after Batman 3. Nevertheless, Warner Brothers sought to move forward with the Justice League film, setting a summer 2009 release date and casting the actors who would bring the JLA to life. With a script made up of the team's classic lineup, Warner Brothers found their newest heroes in the form of DJ Katrona, Army Hammer, and Megan Gale as Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, Adam Brody and Common as Flash and Green Lantern, Santiago Cabrera as Aquaman, and Miller's frequent Mad Max collaborator. Hughes Keys Byrne as Martian Manhunter. In addition, Teresa Palmer was brought on to play Talia al Ghul, and Jay Barrichell signed on to play Maxwell Lord. As we touched on earlier in regards to Batman Begins, the Mulroney's Justice League script decided to look at the comic books for their major inspirations, with much of the film inspired by Mark Wade's popular arc Tower of Babel, a 2000 comic book storyline that took place in JLA number 43 through 46 which saw Ra's al Ghul and the League of Assassins steal Batman's secret contingency plans for the other members of the Justice League, allowing them to exercise them to defeat the League while also attempting to reduce the world's population. So, let's talk about the plot to this film. If you don't already know, the script of Justice League Mortal leaked online in 2013. There'll be a link in the description for anyone who wants to read it. But I'm going to give a brief and somewhat dramatic overview of what the story was going to be. 
The film opens with a funeral sequence, one with all of the various members of the League together in mourning. All of the League are present here except for Batman, and wearing all black versions of their traditional costumes. As a coffin is placed into the grave, the story flashes back two days ago. Batman has finished working on a surveillance satellite which he calls Brother Eye. Meanwhile in Denver, Colorado, Martian Manhunter is investigating a crime scene which catches fire after Johns came into contact with a seahorse-like creature, only to be saved by The Flash and Wonder Woman, who establish that the Justice League has existed for some time and that these heroes are all familiar with one another. The heroes, with the help of Superman, inspect Manhunter, who, as a result of the incident, is repeatedly setting on fire, deducing that whoever orchestrated the attack was aware of his weaknesses, with Superman travelling to Atlantis to question Aquaman, who begrudgingly offers his aid. Bruce Wayne hosts a dinner party at Wayne Manor, where he's greeted by Maxwell Lord, an entrepreneur who owns a chain of successful superhero-themed fast food restaurants named Planet Krypton, before the pair are interrupted by the appearance of Taluel Ghul. Batman later rescues two GCPD officers from a gang of thugs, before one of them transforms into an armoured cyborg known as Omak. Batman manages to escape and return to the Batcave, only to discover that Brother Eye has become self-aware, and is unable to use it. We then see various members of the League attacked in a manner sought to target their own weaknesses. Batman assembles the League and reveals that Brother Eye was created to devise contingency plans against his fellow teammates, which have been stolen and used against them. The team manage to repair their injuries and Flash begins to research their attacks at Planet Krypton with the help of his nephew, Wally West. Wally discovers a failed military project named OMAC, which focuses on nanotechnology and robotics, but then shifted its focus to mind control. Barry and Wally learn that several children were experimented on in order to see if humans could be turned into psychic warriors. Soldiers with the ability to control the enemy were just the power of their minds. All of the children in the OMAC project died, except one, Jonah Wilkes. Wally runs a picture of Wilkes through a forensic aging program to see what he would look like today. And the result they discover is Maxwell Lord. Meanwhile, Superman, Batman and Wonder Woman follow Talio al Ghul to Lord's hideout, where he activates Brother Eye's Phase 1 protocol, and using his own psychic powers, mind controls Superman, forcing the Man of Steel to attack Wonder Woman. The League assembles to subdue the Man of Steel to little avail, with Lord's mind control proving impossible to break. Superman manages to overpower the combined strength of the Justice League, and is prepared to execute Wonder Woman on Lord's command. With little choice, Batman is forced to snap Lord's neck, killing him and freeing Superman. However, it's revealed that Brother Eye's Phase 1 protocol has launched the OMAC virus into nanobots nested in Planet Krypton's fast food, turning anyone who had eaten it into mindless soldiers, and that Lord had actually backed up his brain pattern into the satellite, which captures the Flash and begins to transform him into OMAC Ultra. The League attempts to save Barry while fighting the OMAC soldiers, with Flash's wife, Iris West, rescued by Wally, who is revealed to also be a speedster. Barry, unable to fight back against OMAC's mind control, merges with the speed force and forces OMAC Ultra and Lord's control into oblivion alongside himself. As Barry wheels himself further into the speed force, he notices Wally running alongside him. Wally tells Barry that running faster will tear apart the molecules in his body and kill him. Barry is aware of this and gives Wally a determined but comfortable look, ultimately succumbing to his wounds in the Speed Force and dying, sacrificing himself to save everyone. We cut back to the original sequence of the film at the funeral where it's revealed that we are mourning Barry Allen as Wally West takes his place alongside the fellow heroes as a new member of the Justice League. So, there is clearly a lot to digest here. The film's 128 page script manages to pack in a lot, with many elements borrowed from Tower of Babel, but also Superman's sacrifice, identity crisis, and even Crisis on Infinite Earths. The screenwriters clearly had a real affinity for DC Comics, and wanted this film to include as much of the JLA's greatest hits as possible. Which is not itself a problem, but it's clear the script still needed some major work. However, in November 2007, the Writers Guild of America strike took place, pushing any amendments on the screenplay back 14 weeks 
into December 2008, and ultimately dragging the film behind schedule. Once production resumed in February, they encountered another problem. You see, director George Miller had opted to shoot the film in his native Australia, seeking to take advantage of the nation's new tax incentives for film production. Despite casting several Australians in key roles within the film, and a production crew comprised mostly of Australian natives, the film was deemed eligible to claim the proposed 40% rebate. Miller was noticeably frustrated by this decision, stating that a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for the Australian film industry is being frittered away because of very lazy thinking and as a result Warner Brothers were forced to move the production to Vancouver, with principal photography now pushed back to July 2008. Despite facing many delays, production on Justice League Mortal battled on, with sets and props being constructed while the cast arrived and tested their new costumes. Unfortunately, by this point Warner Brothers' concern for the project had grown too large to ignore, and after the smash success of Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight, the studio had lost faith in his continuously delayed team-up, resulting in the studio shutting down production entirely merely days before principal photography was set to begin. While the downfall of Justice League Mortal could be attributed to the writer's strike or to Miller and Warner Brothers' disagreements over filming locations, one could argue that it was the Dark Knight which put the nail firmly in the coffin, and Nolan's triumph not only guaranteed a third Batman film, but also caused the studio to look at him as the new linchpin for the DC film projects, aiming to use the success of The Dark Knight to launch other standalone movies which followed suit in a similar vein, with the studio announcing a Green Lantern film while also hiring Batman Begins screenwriter David S. Goya to work on a new take on Superman. And while Green Lantern failed to impress audiences and critics, upon its eventual 2011 release, Warner Brothers was hopeful that their new take on Superman would be a hit, hiring Christopher Nolan to oversee production and bringing in 300 and Watchmen director Zack Snyder to bring this new take on The Last Son of Krypton to life, a decision that would change the course of DC's entire cinematic universe and embark us on a path that led to a dawn of justice. Twenty seventeen's Justice League is considered to be one of the biggest missed opportunities in modern cinema, a film which promised to bring together the biggest heroes of DC Comics and usher in a new golden age for the company's cinematic endeavours, but found itself mired in production trouble, resulting in an underwhelming and deeply troubled film. In part one of this video series, we discussed George Miller's failed Justice League Mortal project and the factors which led to its creation, production and cancellation. At the end of that video, I mentioned how Warner Brothers had opted to develop standalone feature films in the vein of Christopher Nolan's successful Dark Knight series, which included a live-action debut for Green Lantern and a rebooted fresh take on Superman. In this video, I want to discuss the developments of the film that became Man of Steel, and another project which was being developed alongside it, Justice League, but not the one you're thinking of, this one, a now scrapped screenplay from writer Will Beale and how these two projects lay very different foundations for the future of the DC Extended Universe and ultimately embarked us on a path which led to 2017's Justice League. By the time of The Dark Knight's release in 2008, Christopher Nolan had cemented himself as one of Warner Brothers' most entrusted filmmakers, a figure whom many at the studio saw as the future of their live-action DC comic endeavours. The success of The Dark Knight saw an immediate green light of a sequel, 2012's The Dark Knight Rises, and during initial conversations on the film's story between Nolan and writer David S. Goya, did early conversations regarding Superman come to light? As Nolan states in a 2010 interview with Superhero Hype, while David Goyer and myself were putting together the story for another Batman film a few years ago, you know, thrashing out where we might move on from the Dark Knight, we got stuck. We were just sitting there idly chatting and he said, by the way, I think I know how you would approach Superman, and he told me his take on it. I thought it was really tremendous. It was the first time I'd been able to conceive of how you'd address Superman in a modern context. I thought it was a very exciting idea. 
Soon after, Goya was hired by Warner Brothers to develop a screenplay for his take on The Man of Tomorrow, with Christopher Nolan also attached to the project as a producer. In October 2010, Deadline reported that Zack Snyder had signed on to direct the project, with the studio hoped would launch not only a new Superman film series, but also the development of more DC Comics motion pictures, with the idea of Justice League still firmly on the table. As a result, in June 2012, just as principal photography of Man of Steel was beginning to conclude, Variety announced that screenwriter Will Beale had been hired to develop a new screenplay for a Justice League film. Beale, who had recently worked on Warner Brothers' Gangster Squad, faced a difficult task ahead of him, not only to conceive a new Justice League film that would satisfy the studio and fans, better so than Miller and the Mulroney's version did, but also managed to use the world established in Man of Steel to springboard off this new connected universe. Soon after, it was reported that not only would Henry Cavill reprise his role as Superman, but the film would see a lineup comprised of himself, a newly recast Batman, Wonder Woman, The Flash and Green Lantern, with the film's antagonist heavily rumoured to be Darkseid, with Ben Affleck's name heavily attached as a possible director, after the filmmaker had impressed Warner Brothers with his directing works on Gone Baby Gone and The Town. Furthermore, while it was reported that Beale's story took inspiration from Jerry Conway's 1980 run of Justice League of America, in particular issues 183 to 185, which saw the team face off against Darkseid, little was actually known about the project until late 2017, when The Wrap published an exclusive which summarised much of the script's components. According to The Wrap, The film would introduce the Justice League as established heroes already familiar with one another, not unlike George Miller's version, with a sequence early on establishing Batman and Superman's existing relationship, as the pair team up to fight KG Beast and Killer Croc, who were attempting to steal Kryptonite on behalf of Lex Luthor, before the sudden appearance of Dassard, who appears and flees through a boom tube with the Kryptonite. Prior to this sequence, the film's opening scene would have established the planet Apocalypse and its villainous ruler, Darkseid. Soon after, Jon Stewart, the film's Green Lantern, will be introduced via an action sequence in which he and Hawkman attempt to stop Kanja Rao, before returning to Oa to discover the dead bodies of much of his fellow Lanterns, who had been massacred on behalf of Darkseid. The first act will conclude with Superman being apprehended by Steppenwolf and a swarm of parademons, who take the fallen hero to Apocalypse. With Superman gone, Batman travels to Themyscira to recruit Diana Prince, before calling upon both Green Lantern and Barry Allen the Flash. With the Lantern Corps and Superman both unable to stop them, Darkseid launches an invasion of Earth, spearheaded by an Apocalyptean army and a brainwashed Superman. In a sequence familiar to many DC fans now after Batman v Superman and The Dark Knight Returns, Batman dons a special suit of armour to subdue and fight the Man of Steel, battling his friend before Wonder Woman can release Superman from Dessard's mind control and Superman rejoins the League in the fight against Darkseid. The League struggles to combat the invading threats, and ultimately, Superman travels through a boom tube where he finds himself some 10 years into the future, in a timeline where Darkseid succeeded and wiped out 80% of the world's population, and only a human resistance led by Batman, Wonder Woman and Lex Luthor keep humanity alive. Superman also discovers that, in this alternate timeline, Bruce and Diana actually have a son together, who they've named Clark Wayne. Lex Luthor reveals to Superman that by mixing the boom tube with the Flash's speed force, it could be possible for Barry to travel back in time to before Darkseid's invasion of Earth, warning the League before the events of the film take place. Future Flash ultimately goes back in time to before Darkseid's invasion, warning his younger self of the impending threat, before dying in his own arms. With this knowledge in hand, the League are able to travel to Apocalypse and rescue Superman before Dessard can brainwash the Man of Steel, and with the aid of the Green Lantern Corps and the Amazonians, prevent Darkseid's invasion from ever succeeding, and therefore preventing this nightmarish future from ever coming to fruition. The script ends with Mercy Graves planning a presidential campaign for Lex Luthor, and Luthor receiving a message from his future self telling him of Superman's secret identity, Clark Kent. While definitely ambitious, Beale's script could be argued to be a little too complex and convoluted for the first outing for this new Justice League, 
and in many ways overcomplicated what the initial film needed to be. In early 2013, reports surfaced stating that Warner Brothers were displeased with what Beale had offered them in his screenplay, and had began considering a huge page one rewrite on the entire script. And by the time that Man of Steel was released in June of that year, it appeared that Beale's take on Justice League had been completely discarded. Soon after the film's release, Deadline reported that both Snyder and Goya had been approached to not only work on a follow-up film to Man of Steel, but also to begin developing a new Justice League film alongside it. With Beale's version of Justice League now officially dead, Snyder and Goya set about envisaging their grand plan for this newly launched DC Cinematic Universe, and with the threads established in Man of Steel, the pair began to conceptualise a grand five film story arc that would be unlike anything ever seen before, which we'd begin to learn about in Batman v Superman before seeing the grand culmination of this in Justice League. Or at least, that was what was going to happen until it wasn't. Watchmen is widely regarded as one of the greatest graphic novels ever created. Brought to life by Alan Moore, Dave Gibbons and John Higgins, this dystopian deconstruction of superheroes and the Cold War proved to be an enormous success upon its 1986 release. And ever since Watchmen first hit the shelves, the prospect of bringing its alternate history tale to the big screen always seemed to be in discussion. Yes, while Zack Snyder did give us a Watchmen movie in 2009, the notion of Watchmen being developed as a live-action feature film had actually been kicked around for a long time, with Brazil and Fear and Loathing Las Vegas director Terry Gilliam attached to the project for a number of years. So, in this video, we're going to do our own bit of alternate history and look at the rise and fall of Terry Gilliam's cancelled Watchmen movie. We'll look at the origins of the project at 20th Century Fox, the various treatments and screenplays which tried to bring this epic story to life, and the factors that ultimately led to the film's cancellation, and the factors that ultimately led to this version of the film never seeing the light of day. So, before we dive into the attempts to bring Watchmen to the big screen, I want to quickly go over the basic premise of the series, for those who might be unfamiliar. Watchmen was a 1986 12-issue series written by Alan Moore with art by Dave Gibbons, set in an alternate version of the 1980s, in a world where costume vigilantes existed and eventually became outlawed, with the story now following the now retired or underground heroes and their struggles with morality in the backdrop of an impending nuclear war. Originally pitched to DC Comics as a way to reinvent the characters of the now defunct Charlton Comics Company, Watchmen quickly became a sensation overnight, often being referred to as one of the all-time great graphic novels. It's no surprise, therefore, that the story caught the eye of Hollywood producers, with many seeking to turn Moore's dystopian comic into a live-action feature film. In August 1986, the Watchmen film rights were bought by producer Lawrence Gordon for 20th Century Fox, with Joel Silver being hired to serve as a lead producer on the film. Alan Moore was invited to submit a treatment for the film's script, but he unsurprisingly declined, leading to Sam Hamm, who would later go on to write both Tim Burton's 1989 Batman and its 1992 follow-up Batman Returns to pen a new screenplay for Watchmen. Hamm, at this time a budding screenwriter, looking to carve out his name in the industry, had a monumental task ahead of him. Watchmen was a 338 pages with nine panels on each page graphic novel, meaning that in order to get the film down to a concise runtime, significant changes would have to be made. Ham's first draft submitted in 1988 changed a number of elements from the original graphic novel, namely removing the likes of Rorschach's narration and the entire Tales of the Black Freighter subplot, renaming the superhero team from the Crime Busters to the Watchmen, and rewriting the entire third act of the story. The film would open with a flashback to 1976, where the Watchmen failed to stop a terrorist attack at the Statue of Liberty, an event which would cause the government's ban on masks and superheroes. We would then flash forward ten years later, with Rorschach investigating the death of the comedian, 
and meeting up with the former Night Owl to discuss the implications of their former colleague's death. Rorschach would also meet with Adrian Veidt, the former Ozymandias, and now a wealthy philanthropist, who takes the information and relays it to the other ex-Watchmen members, Dr. Manhattan and Silk Spectre, with the three theorising that whoever killed the comedian may also be out to get the other members of the team. Around this time, it's also established that a number of former colleagues of Dr. Manhattan had began to contract cancer, with Silk Spectre herself becoming concerned for her health due to the pair's ongoing relationship. Dr. Manhattan is confronted with these allegations while appearing on television, resulting in the former hero exiling himself to Mars. And with him gone, Silk Spectre eventually reconnects with Night Owl, and the pair begin a relationship, whilst Rorschach is framed for the murder of a former adversary and imprisoned. Night Owl and Silk Spectre do break Rorschach out of prison, and the trio, alongside a now returned Dr. Manhattan, reconvene at Ozymandias' base in Antarctica. There, it's revealed that Veidt had been behind the comedian's murder, Rorschach's framing, and Silk Spectre's cancer scare, as the former hero unveils his master plan. And I think I'm going to let Joel Silver, the film's producer, describe what would happen next. He stated, Instead of the whole notion of the intergalactic thing, which was too hard and too silly, what he did was he maintained that the existence of Dr. Manhattan had changed the whole balance of the world economy. He felt that that character really altered the way reality had been. He had the Ozymandias character convince, essentially, the Dr. Manhattan character to go back and stop himself from being created. So there never would be a Dr. Manhattan. He was the only character with real supernatural powers. He went back and prevented himself from being turned into Dr. Manhattan. And in the vortex that was created after that occurred, these characters from Watchmen only became characters in a comic book. So, yeah. Ham's conclusion to Watchmen would have ditched the entire giant squid element from the comic and instead see Ozymandias build a wormhole in space with the intention of using it to kill John Osterman before he became Dr. Manhattan and ultimately preventing the escalation of the Cold War to the point of nuclear annihilation. Veidt is vaporised by the machine as he attempts to flee from his former teammates before Dr. Manhattan decides to use it, travelling back to 1962 and preventing himself from being disintegrated and reformed as his godlike self, creating an alternate timeline where in the film's present day, America lost the Vietnam War, President Nixon was forced to resign after the Watergate scandal, and nuclear war is adverted. Rorschach, Night Owl and Silk Spectre watch on as they're transported into New York City, where they see that their former lives and memories now only exist in the pages of comics on a newsstand, entitled the Watchmen, as the costume trio look on confused as the film ends. After Ham's treatment was submitted to 20th Century Fox in 1988, momentum on the Watchmen film began to fluctuate. Initially, it seems as if the project was moving ahead fast, with a tentative 1991 release date set, and producer Lawrence Gordon setting up his production studio, Largo Entertainment, to produce the film while Fox would distribute it. However, by 1994, Gordon had quit Largo altogether and moved Watchmen over to Warner Brothers, where Terry Gilliam, who had recently directed the dystopian sci-fi film Brazil, was hired to helm the film. A second draft of Ham's screenplay was commissioned soon after, with the writer working alongside Warren Scarron and Charles McEwen to retune the film's script, with these rewrites adding in discarded comic book elements such as Rorschach's journal as the film's narration. And with the script now finished, it seemed like Watchmen was finally ready to step in front of cameras. According to Dave Gibbons, dates for shooting the film were arranged and scheduled at Pinewood Studios, while producer Joel Silver openly courted Arnold Schwarzenegger to play the role of Dr. Manhattan. However, the film's production quickly ran into a major problem. You see, in 1988, Terry Gilliam had directed The Adventures of Baron Munchausen for Columbia Pictures, with the film's budget ballooning to an estimated $46 million. Around this same time, Joel Silver had recently been responsible for producing Die Hard 2, a film which also saw its budget rise exponentially to around $70 million during production. For these reasons, although Warner Brothers were keen on bringing Watchmen to life, they were concerned about both Silver and Gilliam's ability to restrain the budget. 
causing the studio to only allocate $25 million to make the film, a quarter of what the producers had initially conceived. This slashing of the movie's budget ultimately saw Watchmen's production halt for a number of years, with Terry Gilliam eventually leaving the project altogether in November of 2000. Unable to make the movie that he'd envisaged, with significant changes required to both its scope and runtime, as a result of the reduced budget, with Gilliam stating that reducing the story to a two or a two and a half hour film seemed to me to take away the essence of what Watchmen is about. Without Gilliam, Warner Brothers eventually dropped Watchmen altogether, and much like its dark alternate history, the future seemed bleak for the prospects of this film ever actually being made. Gordon and Silver took the project to both Universal and Paramount in the subsequent years, and although directors such as Darren Aronofsky and Paul Greengrass became attached at various points, little progress was ever made on the film. Time and time again, Watchmen simply failed to enter production. Whether it was the scope, the nature of the story, or the studio's apprehension at the amount of money needed to make the film properly, Watchmen quickly became an infamous resident of Hollywood's development hell, with Terry Gilliam even going as far as to call the project itself unfilmable. Eventually though, Watchmen did make it to the big screen. In December 2005, the project returned to Warner Brothers, where the studio hired 300 director Zack Snyder to helm the film. Principal photography began in September 2007 on an estimated budget of $120 million and Watchmen was finally released to the world in March of 2009. After a near 30 year struggle to film the unfilmable, it had finally been accomplished. Snyder's Watchmen film ultimately remained closer to the source material than the version conceived by Gilliam and Ham, with the latter's being a much less cynical and darker film, and a number of massive changes to the identity and the core of what Watchmen as a graphic novel is. Famously, when Gilliam exited the project, he told Gordon and Silver that Watchmen could never be its true form in a film, instead recommending producing an episodic miniseries for television, and with HBO and Damon Lindelof's nine episode Watchmen series on the horizon, I find it interesting to look at the long and arduous history that Watchmen has had behind the scenes. Studios were trying to bring the story to life as early as the mid-1980s, and it's only within the last decade that it's actually become a reality. But the question remains, how different would things have been if Watchmen did indeed make its way onto the big screens in the 1990s, and how would it affect both the future adaptations of the story, and also the wider future of live-action comic book adaptations? I guess we'll never know for sure, but as Watchmen now makes its way onto television, I think it's worth keeping in mind the long and storied history that this franchise has had, and the many attempts to get an adaptation off the ground that would allow fans of this incredible comic book to have the opportunity to truly watch The Watchmen. Superman is, without a doubt, the most recognisable and iconic superhero in the world, and the character has served as the face for the entire genre ever since he leapt onto the pages of comics in a single bound back in 1938, and then onto the silver screen again in 1978. The classic Richard Donner Superman the movie stands apart as a moment in time and has left a long-standing legacy, both in terms of cinema and the idea of the blockbuster film, and also in proving that superheroes can be a success on the big screen, something we're all too familiar with today. Despite this, the Superman film series has had its fair share of problems. The series born out of the toil of Donna had fallen on hard times in the years following, after the critical failures of Superman 3 and Superman 4 The Quest for Peace. And it wasn't until 1989's Batman that superhero movies returned to the forefront of the cultural zeitgeist, but now presented in a much darker manner. Over the next decade, Warner Brothers sought to revitalise the man of tomorrow and return him to the big screen, attempting everything from a poorly devised Superman 5 to the infamous Tim Burton-directed Superman Lives project 
starring Nicolas Cage. None of these managed to materialise though, and as we entered the new millennium, Superman seemed to be fading a distant memory in cinema that could never be replicated. However, Warner Brothers were adamant that the Man of Steel would return to the big screen, and chose to take a leap of faith, giving this universally beloved character and franchise to an up-and-coming screenwriter currently making his name on the ABC television series Alias, J.J. Abrams. In 2002, when commissioned to pen a screenplay for a new Superman film, Abrams was still relatively unknown in Hollywood, several years away from carving his name through his hit series Lost. And when faced with bringing back such an iconic character as Superman, it could be a daunting task for any screenwriter. Abrams, however, refused to play it safe. Turning in his original draft in July 2002, Abrams completely reimagined the Superman mythos, offering up a fresh and somewhat controversial spin on the beloved character, much in the same way he did several years later with his reboot of Star Trek. Firstly, JJ sought to start from the beginning, establishing the planet Krypton and the circumstances which predicated its downfall, a disastrous civil war which had ravaged the planet, forcing Jor-El, now depicted as Krypton's king, to send his only son to Earth, in an attempt to spare his life from his tyrannical uncle, Katazor. And while this sounds extremely different from what we're used to, Abrams was quick to point out that he sought to focus much of the origin on Clark's upbringing on Earth, telling Empire Magazine that, the thing I tried to emphasize in the story was that if the Kents found the boy, Kal-El, who had the power that he did, he would most likely kill them both in short order. And the idea that these parents would see if they were lucky to survive long enough, that they had to immediately begin teaching this kid to limit himself and not be so fast, not be so strong and not be so powerful. The script would then introduce much of the traditional characters and locations expected to be found within a Superman film. Lois Lane, Perry White, Lex Luthor, Metropolis, Smallville and so on. But reimagined for Abrams' new vision. For example, while Lex still served as a main antagonist in his story, he wasn't exactly the cunning billionaire we know him to be instead a federal CIA agent obsessed with aliens and UFOs. The film would also borrow heavily from Dan Jurgen's seminal 1992 comic book, The Death of Superman, which Warner Brothers was also keen to adapt at this time, serving as a major inspiration for Burton's Superman Lives project also. With Superman murdered by Kryptonian soldiers, led by the General Tizor, son of Katazor and cousin of Kal-El, before being resurrected and rescuing the Earth from its alien conquerors, before setting off to find Krypton, which, in Abram's treatment, didn't blow up, but was still under the ruthless fist of Katazor. Furthermore, in later drafts, he also toyed with the idea of outing Lex Luthor as a Kryptonian sleeper agent, with the film's climax to be a Man of Steel-esque battle sequence between the two metahumans, with Superman defeating Lex. Despite the major deviations from the source material, Warner Brothers were still keen to produce the script, seeing the success of Sony's Spider-Man film earlier that year, but were nerved at the idea of handing directing duties over to the young screenwriter. After previously approaching Charlie's Angel director, McGee, Rush Hour director Brett Ratner was hired to helm the film in September 2002, and casting talks along with concept art had began to surface soon after. Ratner was keen to avoid hiring an A-list actor to play the role of Superman, after approaching the likes of Jude Law, Paul Walker and Josh Hartnett. In early 2003, he told IGN that No star wants to sign that, but as much as I've told Jude and Josh my vision for the movie, I've warned them the consequences of being Superman. They'll live this character for 10 years because I'm telling one story over three movies, and plan to direct all three if the first is as successful as everyone suspects. In addition, several high-profile names were targeted for Superman's supporting cast, most notably Kerry Russell and Amy Adams as Lois Lane, the latter who would go on to play the role in 2013's Man of Steel, Anthony Hopkins as Jor-El, and Christopher Walken as Perry White, with Joel Edgerton also auditioning for the role of the villainous Tizor. However, while things had appeared to be moving forward for Flyby, the production came to a halt in March 2003, with Ratner leaving the project after excessive creative differences with producer John Peters and the escalating budget of which Abrams' script demanded. As a result, McGee was brought back onto the project to replace Ratner, bringing in the OC creator Josh Schwartz to redraft Abrams' screenplay, 
while Robert Downey Jr. had allegedly signed on to play Lex Luthor. With a tweak script, ESC Entertainment was hired to create the film's visual effects, costumes were created, and the film was set to shoot the following year, despite arguments between studio executives and McGee over whether to shoot Flyby in Canada or Australia, with the director stating that it was inappropriate to try and capture the heart of America on another continent. This proved to be one stumbling block too many for the film, and as every day passed, the prospects of it actually being made began to dwindle. Test footage was shot for the film with several candidates for The Man of Steel, with eventual casting Henry Cavill shooting scenes, but little more movement on the project was made, and McGee exited the project in June 2004. Interestingly, around this time, X-Men director Brian Singer had pitched his idea for a new Superman film to Warner Brothers. This version, however, a continuation of the classic Christopher Reeve series, albeit with a fresh actor occupying the role of Superman. Singer signed on a month after McGee's departure, and Flyby became little more than another what could have been in the Hollywood graveyard. And while Singer's resulting effort, 2006's Superman Returns, was hardly beloved by audiences who found the film to lack the necessary action and excitement that a Superman movie should entail, I can't help but kind of be glad that Abrams' vision was never realised. Don't get me wrong, I like J.J. Abrams as a filmmaker, but I feel that this drastically different take on Superman would have been detrimental to both the long-term cinematic success of the character, but also to Abrams' career as an aspiring director and producer. If Flyby had received the same reactions upon release as it had when Abrams' script was leaked online in September 2002, it would likely have killed any attempt for him to make future projects such as Lost and Cloverfield, as well as finding work in established franchises such as Mission Impossible 3 and his reboot of Star Trek. Moreover, while I like Abrams' decision to offer a unique take on Superman, change isn't always positive and Flyby's story felt so drastically un-Superman that it would have been better served as an original, yet still generic feeling, sci-fi epic. The film would also have had serious ramifications to the landscape of comic book movies as we know them. If Flyby had been released in summer 2006 instead of Singer's Returns, it's likely that Warner Brothers would be reluctant to make another attempt to retell the character's backstory only a few years later, meaning no Man of Steel, and therefore no DC Extended Universe. And while casting announcements for this film were scarce, McGee had stated on multiple occasions that Robert Downey Jr. signed on to play Lex Luthor, and this itself would have definitely hurt his chances of landing the role of Iron Man two years later, fundamentally changing the nucleus of what grew into the Marvel Cinematic Universe and began to revolutionise the entire superhero movie genre. If Superman Flyby had failed to impress audiences and critics, it's likely that comic book movies would still be in the same slump they were at the time of the film's production. Sure, there were diamonds in the rough such as Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, Singer's X-Men and Christopher Nolan's fresh take on Batman in 2005, but the genre was nowhere near the commercial juggernaut that we now know it to be today, and likely would never have been able to become this either. Darren Aronofsky is one of the most divisive and controversial filmmakers working today, his most recent film, Mother, having split critical opinions right down the middle, some holding it as a clever, thought-provoking insight into the problems of humanity, while others deem it to be little more than a pretentious example of style over substance. Despite this, Aronofsky has certainly crafted his niche in Hollywood, with films such as Requiem for a Dream, Black Swan and The Wrestler, and regardless of your personal opinions on his work, it's undoubtable to say that Aronofsky presents his films and his characters in a very visceral and harsh nature. These sensibilities, which have become a hallmark style of his work, would have lended themselves well to telling a story about a dark anti-hero, one driven by a burning sense of injustice and vengeance, in the form of Batman. Aronofsky's Batman project is one of the more interesting and elusive what-ifs in film history, and would have had serious ramifications for not only the character that we know to be the Dark Knight, but also to the modern cinematic landscape as a whole. The Batman film series had finally run out of steam in 1997, the critical and commercial failure 
that was Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin had finally undone all of the great work laid out by Tim Burton and Michael Keaton, and Batman, much like his parents before him, appeared to be lying dead in the gutter, with no hope of salvation. Warner Brothers had attempted a variety of different ways to bring back the Cape Crusader, from planned sequels to Batman and Robin aimed to darken the tone and return the series to its Burton-esque roots, to a Batman and Superman crossover film, an idea they clearly had in mind the next time they had to reboot the character. But none of these really materialised, while scripts were turned in by Mark Protashevich and Akiva Goldsman for these respective films, Warner Brothers failed to settle on a clear plan for the future of Batman. And this is when they stumbled upon an exciting new director, fresh off the success of his debut feature film, Darren Aronofsky. In 1998, Aronofsky released Pi, a surreal psychological thriller centred around a paranoid mathematician obsessed with the irrational number of which the film was named after. Pi was a surprise hit with critics, earning Aronofsky the directing award at the 1998 Sundance Film Festival, and an Independent Spirit Award for Best First Screenplay. Soon after this, he began working on his follow-up film, 2000's Requiem for a Dream, a psychological drama about drug addiction, based on a 1978 novel by Hubert Selby Jr. However, while working on Requiem, Aronofsky became involved in developing a live-action adaptation of Frank Miller's cyberpunk comic Ronan. Despite signing with New Line Cinema in 1998 to bring the story to life, Miller and Aronofsky's Ronan never saw the light of day, but it was this collaboration that birthed a new idea, Batman. In mid-2000, Aronofsky was brought in by Warner Brothers to offer his new take on Batman, with the director aiming to retell the character's origin story as a way to move away from the Schumacher films and seeking to adapt the most popular and infamous Batman origin story, Frank Miller's 1987 Batman Year One. Aronofsky brought Miller onto the project as a writer, with the pair seeking to adapt the themes of the classic story while also presenting a more grounded and realistic take on The Dark Knight's early years. In a December 2000 interview with IGN, Aronofsky stated that the film would be somewhat based on the comic, but warned audiences to toss out everything you can imagine about Batman, we're starting completely anew. After seeing how Schumacher's films had failed through a mandate of style over substance, the quality of film being put second behind merchandise and toy appeal, Aronofsky chose to strip back many of these elements of the character, and instead offer a more grounded and street level Batman, unlike anything we'd ever seen on screen before. And while Aronofsky sought to preserve the core essentials of the Batman mythos, he and Miller sought to rebuild this core in a radically new way. For instance, the film would open with the young Bruce Wayne witnessing the death of his parents, but instead of being sheltered at Wayne Manor by Alfred until leaving to travel the world, Bruce loses his fortune and is forced to live on the streets before being took in by Big Al, the owner of an auto repair shop. We would see Bruce, now in his early 20s, watch the world around him deteriorate as he comes of age, witnessing Gotham's fall into corruption, crime and sleaze in an almost taxi driver-esque way. Instead of presenting Batman as a heroic, well-trained Avenger of the night, Aronofsky wanted his Batman to be the manifestation of the rage and anger that Bruce Wayne felt. This Batman wouldn't rely on state-of-the-art tech and gadgets and instead donned a cheap homemade suit and whatever weapons he could either find or make in order to wage his war on crime. This DIY take on the character is best characterised in Aronofsky's idea for both the Batcave and the Batmobile, the former being an abandoned underground subway tunnel and the latter being a Lincoln Continental with two bus engines in it. Despite Miller and Aronofsky's excitement towards the project, convincing Warner Brothers to greenlight a hard R noir Batman film proved to be challenging and ultimately caused the production to fall apart with all that remained being the basic premise, a gritty retelling of Batman's early years with a heavy inspiration from Batman Year One. And this was later developed by a new director, one who had also become a hot prospect in Hollywood thanks to the success 
of his own independent films, Christopher Nolan, who signed on to direct a new Batman film in January 2003, and in the summer of 2005, the world finally saw this vision manifest in Batman Begins. However, while promoting his latest film, Mother, Aronofsky was asked about his Batman pitch, stating that I think we were basically 15 years too early, because I hear the way they're talking about the Joker movie, and that's exactly my pitch. He added that, and I was always like, why can't we make a more low budget R rated movie, just like in comics you have different brands, but now they're finally doing that. This is an exciting time, because they'll be able to take more risks, and we won't be seeing the same movie over again. You'll get things like Deadpool, which was a relief as compared to seeing the same film over and over again. And while Nolan's Batman Begins film very much ushered in a renaissance age for Batman, and the success of its sequel 2008's The Dark Knight changed the landscape of comic book movies entirely, it's hard to deny there is something so intrinsically fascinating about Aronofsky's proposed Batman film. While it's true that it would be a huge departure from what we're used to seeing from the character, I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing. While his and Miller's treatments did strip away many of the key parts of what makes Batman so great, it doesn't strip away what makes him Batman, and while it would possibly feel more like the Punisher than it would the Dark Knight, there's a part of me that does begin to wonder what the world's perception of Batman would be if instead of Batman Begins, our first Batman film in eight years would be a taxi driver inspired noir film, and what in turn that would mean for the entire comic book movie genre. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching today's video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to leave a like on this video and leave a comment down below as well. I can't wait to hear what you have to say as always. If you're new to Owen Likes Comics, please make sure to hit the subscribe button and the notify bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. And if you enjoyed this and you want some more, there should be some other videos on screen right now that you might also enjoy. If you want to help support the channel and help me make more videos, you can do so over at patreon.com slash owenlikescomics. Or if you just want some more of me, you can follow me on Twitter just at owenlikescomics. But that's all for this video. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and hopefully I'll see you next time. But until then, take care and keep reading.